Before we move into the text from which I read, let me offer a few bits of information that will inform our thinking about Revelation for the next eight weeks. The first and perhaps most important, if Matt were here, he would say so, is that there is a single revelation. One revelation, not revelations. This single revelation takes shape, however, as multiple visions. It is in those visions that we tend to get lost, but we'll get to those later. Secondly, the revelation was given to John as we see in verse 1, but we don't know who that John is. Just as John is a familiar name in our time, so it was in the time of Revelation. Scholars doubt that it was the gospel writer John, or that it is John, son of Zebedee, who was a disciple, or the writer of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It is quite possible, in fact, that John was simply a pen name. John writes from the island of Patmos, to which he seems to have been exiled. The third statement that I would make is that the thing that is clear about the source of Revelation is that the Revelation itself is none other than Jesus Christ. Verse 1 states, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him. Indeed, this is the Word of God. Fourth, though the dating of the writing of Revelation has been long debated, most modern scholars believe it was written near the end of the reign of the Roman ruler Domitian, probably around 95 AD, a couple of generations then after the death of Jesus. The letter was written to the seven churches in Asia Minor who were being tempted to accommodate to the Roman culture. Though there was no widespread persecution of Christians at that time, there was the expectation that persecution may occur if the Christians didn't act like everyone else. And finally, I return to one of the primary points that Dr. Blunt emphasized last week. The Revelation is apocalyptic literature which means that its goal is to reveal or to unveil something. The Revelation is the longest and purest form of apocalyptic literature in Scripture. It also occurs in other places, including Ezekiel. Remember the dry bones? That's part of a vision. In Daniel, from which I read, in Isaiah and Zechariah, and in short New Testament passages in the Gospel of Mark, in 2 Thessalonians, and in 2 Peter. In every case, apocalyptic passages intend to reveal the truth about the future. They intend to reveal the truth about the future, a truth that enables the hearers and readers to see and understand the present in a new light, for they understand what the future holds for them. The truth revealed in Revelation is that God who was is God who is, and that God will come again and will be forevermore. And that, my friends, is good news to a people who fear persecution. It is important to note that apocalyptic writing has an ethical motivation. That is, it encourages people to act even in the present in a way that is consistent with their understanding of the future. We will see that very clearly next week as we examine the letters to the churches. Apocalyptic writing also includes a concern for the world. It does not offer hope simply for an individual or a select group of people. It holds the entire world in view and seeks to offer hope broadly. So today we jump into the shallow end of the Revelation pool where the images are simple and the words, if not familiar, are certainly accessible. 
Since most of us are neophytes in the world of Revelation, I invite you, if you would, to open your pew Bible to page 230. This is not the kind of preaching we often do here, but I am going to go verse by verse, and it might be helpful for us to have an opportunity to read it together. We'll start at verse 1, where John begins with a sentence that spans two verses, states the purpose of his writing, and is surely anathema to any good English teacher. Listen again as you reflect on what you have already heard. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So what John does here is affirm that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ and that it has been given to him by God. He also affirms that an angel has been sent to him and he names himself as the recipient of the revelation. So right out of the gate, John evokes the name of an angel, somewhat of a supernatural being and perhaps a bearer of visions. In verse 2, the first of seven Beatitudes in Revelation occurs. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written, for the time is near. Like many New Testament letters, Revelation was intended to be read aloud in worship in its entirety. Wow, that's a lot of words. If we were to read Revelation every week for the next eight weeks, perhaps we would get a handle on the vision. In verse 3, John shifts into letter-writing mode. He writes to the seven churches, each of which is located in a prominent city in the Roman province of Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. Each of the churches is within about 100 miles of Ephesus. John affirms what the Christians in those churches already know, that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. Jesus Christ himself is the witness, and that by his life, death, and resurrection, they, the people in the churches, will taste eternal life. Important numeric symbolism is quickly introduced. The number seven is used 57 times in Revelation and suggests completion or perfection. In other words, the seven churches represent all, all of the Christian churches at that time and in the time to come. In verse 4, John uses the threefold name for God from him who is and who was and who is to come. This designation, in fact, alludes to the Jewish name for God, which is found in Exodus and we know as Yahweh. In the same way, Jesus is described with a threefold title, faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Both of these ways of describing first God and then Jesus move us in the direction of a Trinitarian understanding of who God is. And finally, in verse 8, we move to what endures as one of the most significant and memorable affirmations of Revelation. The Lord God is the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is and who was and who is yet to come. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet and suggest by their use that Jesus, the Lord God, is everything, beginning and end, first and last, Alpha and Omega, and everything in between. 
And that is the gospel for us today. Every day brings reminders that this promise is not yet fulfilled. That the promises of Easter have not yet been realized. That the one who is and who was has still not yet come again. We see signs of that unrealized promise all around us. Cancer takes hold and grows in someone you love. Addiction rears its head. Dreams die. An alligator attack takes the life of a two-year-old. Family systems struggle. The resentment you have worked hard to overcome simmers just below the surface. The job you have prepared yourself for for a decade goes to someone else. You don't make the team or get the part you wanted or come off the waiting list. And we long for the one who is to come who will gather up the brokenhearted and heal every pain. The past week has been particularly difficult for citizens of the kingdom of God. When a young man wielding an assault weapon kills 49 people while they are at play and injures a dozen more, we are aware that the kingdom of God has not yet come. And in the wake of that horrific tragedy, the insults that have been hurled at the LGBT community, the Muslim community, and indeed all immigrants, insults at the FBI, the President of the United States, the Orlando Police Department, and any other easy target, remind us we live in a time when Christ has not yet come to completion. But we ache for the time when Christ will come, for the time when Christ will bring his kingdom to completion on earth. As we process yet another national tragedy in light of the apocalypse in Revelation, I return us to two important elements of this literature. First, Apocalyptic literature contains an ethical motivation. That is, people of faith are called to act. Called to act in the present in a way that is consistent with their hope for the future. And secondly, the hope of the apocalypse is not simply for an individual or for a small group of people. Apocalyptic hope holds the entire world in view. At the very least, it seems to me that we who wait under the banner of Jesus Christ are called to respond to any national tragedy with compassion. With the compassion that Christ extended to all people. And we are called to speak a word of love. There may be much to hate, but this is a time for us to speak as those who know the love of God in Jesus Christ. And it seems that we are called to respond and to live as people of hope. There is despair all around us. Perhaps our lives, our words, our actions may witness to the hope that is in us. And finally, I think we are called to work to change the deeply embedded attitudes that lead to hate and to begin with ourselves. We must resist name-calling, isolation, and the tendency to join the negative cries that ring in our ears. 
As we affirm in the brief statement of faith, we live in a broken and sinful world. Brokenness and sinfulness are all around us. And yet, and yet, we trust in the Alpha and the Omega, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is yet to come. We wait for the coming day when evil will be overcome, and until then we work to bring light into the darkness. We work to speak hope to despair and to let love be the final word in the name of Jesus Christ. May God grant us peace as we watch and wait for the unfolding of the kingdom. Amen.